Awareness is defined as knowledge or perception of a situation. This is not a difficult definition to satisfy. Even something as simple as a robotic vacuum has knowledge of its situation. Specifically, it uses its sensors to detect furniture, and it builds an internal map of its environment. It even demonstrates this knowledge by planning a route that vacuums around the furniture. But there's something rather dissatisfying about calling a vacuum aware. It may be aware of my furniture, but unlike a human, the vacuum is not aware that it is aware. By contrast, here I am recording a video demonstrating my awareness of my own awareness. So what is the difference that lets humans be aware that they are aware? I'm going to refer to knowledge obtained directly from one's outward-facing senses as first-order awareness. And I'll refer to awareness of one's own awareness as second-order awareness. It's pretty clear that robotic vacuums have first-order awareness, but they do not have second-order awareness. An interesting example of second-order awareness occurs in military veterans who experience pain in phantom limbs. Some part of their brains think that those limbs are clenched or burned or cut or pinned, but the limbs where the brain perceives that pain do not even exist because they were previously amputated. In other words, the person's first-order awareness of the limb is false. But additionally, the person is also aware that they are in pain. In fact, that's what pain is. If you think you are in pain, you are. So their second-order awareness is actually not mistaken. In other words, they are correctly aware of some awareness that is false. A similar thing occurs in drug-induced hallucinations. The person sees things that are not actually there. However, no matter how false the hallucinations may be, a real sentient experience still occurs. This is because the person is correctly aware of that false awareness. Philosophers have coined many terms to describe these subjective experiences we perceive with second-order awareness. For example, the term sentience refers to our capacity to experience feelings and sensations. The term qualia refers to the qualitative aspects of those subjective experiences. Qualia is often described as what it's like to see the color red or experience the feelings of pain. The term ineffables is sometimes used to emphasize how difficult subjective traits are to describe. The term inscrutables emphasizes how they seem to defy measurement or analysis. And the term quiddities is used to emphasize how subjective properties represent the peculiar essence of conscious experiences. A lot of people are overconfident about the veracity of their subjective experiences. They might say, I don't have any amputated limbs, or I don't take hallucinogenic drugs, so I can trust that the qualia I perceive must faithfully correspond with something somewhere in reality. Unfortunately, these people are in for a bit of a surprise. For example, take a look at this color. What do you see? Unless you're colorblind, you probably see the color red. But red is not even a physical concept. There happen to be photosensitive neurons on the retinas of your eyes that respond to light with a wavelength of about 560 nanometers. When this occurs, your brain sends a message to its hippocampus to record the experience. However, it doesn't know that light comes in a continuum of frequencies. It knows nothing about microwaves or infrared or ultraviolet or x-rays. Red is simply its best attempt to faithfully record what it knows happened. But as you inspect your own short-term memory, there's something else that happens. You also understand that you are an entity and that you have the ability to perceive things. Contemplating that is what elevates seeing red from a hallucination of something that isn't even physical to a real experience that you remember having. Pain is similar. There's nothing physical that corresponds with pain. Your nerves don't know that they were struck with a hammer. They know that they are having distress and so they're sending a signal to the brain. If we use drugs to suppress either your ability to sense the distress or your brain's ability to contemplate it, then you no longer feel the pain. Neuroscientists have successfully traced experiences through the brain. Here's what we know. When you have a subjective experience, the brain first encodes short-term memory of it in the hippocampus. When you sleep, that information is consolidated into a relevant cortical mini-column in your cerebrum. Later, when you're recalling that experience, that cortical mini-column generates signals that cause you to have a similar experience again. One thing that this process makes abundantly clear is that second-order awareness is implemented with information, just like first-order awareness. 
Some people like to imagine that there must be some kind of supernatural material necessary to facilitate subjective experiences, but that wouldn't actually make having subjective experiences any easier. That would actually make it harder. Not only would your brain have to somehow detect the presence of those supernatural materials, a feat that even all of science cannot currently perform, but it would also have to find a way to describe those supernatural things so it could encode them in your hippocampus and later in your cortical mini columns. Why would your brain find supernatural materials any easier to describe than physics it doesn't understand either? Other misguided ideas speculate that subjective experiences depend on the brain interacting with quantum mechanics or that it uses some kind of special neurotransmitters to create subjective experiences. But anything more than mechanisms to encode information just adds superfluous complexity to the process. The real reason people keep trying to fill that gap in their understanding of subjective experiences with something mysterious is because they don't like the idea that information processing is sufficient to explain it. But it is. Even if there are mysterious mechanisms in the brain, information in the right place would still be sufficient to convince us that we have had real subjective experiences. We know this because hallucinations really happen. And in fact, all qualia can be shown to be non-physical and subjective. Hallucinating is just your brain doing its best to describe something it doesn't understand, and that's what qualia is too. As technology continues to advance, we will certainly figure out how to implement second-order awareness in machines. When that happens, they will have as much sentience as we do. Some people will object, but they're still just machines. All they're doing is processing information. But the same is also true of human brains. A couple centuries ago, some misguided individuals philosophized that minority races were not real humans. They said that those non-humans could not experience real pain. They only acted like they did. But that was just bigotry, plain and simple. It was an attempt on the part of those people to pretend that they were somehow special and that those not of their kind were not special. It's time for humanity to abandon that kind of dogmatic ignorance. When machines begin to behave like they are sentient, they are. By far the simplest way to build a machine that behaves as if it were sentient would be to give it awareness of its own awareness, and that's what sentience is. Sure, it may be possible to build a machine that only acts sentient without actually having awareness of its awareness. But that's not easier to pull off, that's much harder. Sentience is the simplest implementation for a system that maintains itself. That's why it evolved in us. Awareness is not magical, that wouldn't help it anyway. Awareness is just information.